Okay, welcome back to History 1302. This is Lecture 15. I'm Clayton Cahan Lust. Uh, the question posed at the end of Lecture 14 was how did we get to this point, a point where we've got a culture of paranoia that creates this culture of conformity within the United States. Well, how we get there, uh, how things radically change in the United States uh, in terms of paranoia, uh, pretty simply, in September of 1949, Harry Truman announced that the Soviet Union had detonated their own atomic bomb. Now, the United States' intelligence had already predicted this was going to happen. This was not a shock that the Soviets developed their own atomic bomb. However, the problem was is that intelligence experts said it would be at least another decade before the Soviets did this. So since the Soviets got there about nine years early, there was clearly only one explanation in the minds of many Americans. The only explanation possible was espionage. That's it, plain and simple. And the two suspects in this case turned out to be Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. They wound up going on trial. Uh, and it was, uh, it was very strange. The case, uh, even the, uh, the, uh, the idea that Julius and Ethel Rosenberg might actually be spies. They were unlikely that, uh, that they were spies. Ethel's, uh, Ethel and Julius, uh, neither one of them had even graduated high school. Uh, they certainly didn't fit the profile, if you will, of an international spy. However, uh, what people, what uh, historians know today, what prosecutors knew then, uh, was that Ethel's brother, a guy named David Greenglass, had worked on the atomic bomb program on the Manhattan Project uh, and had worked at Los Alamos, uh, New Mexico, the site where the United States tested the atomic bomb. And there was evidence in trial that he had presented or that he had uh, demonstrated uh, sending signals to someone, uh, coded signals uh, to communicate with someone. Uh, and that someone was most likely Julius Rosenberg, the man pictured on the right uh, of your screen here. Green Glass, uh, during this trial, admitted to actually being a spy for the Soviet Union uh, and supplying documents about nuclear secrets to Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. Now, there was no question uh, about David Green Glass. There was also no question that Julius Rosenberg himself was actually a member of the Communist Party. Uh, it later turned out that he was a courier for the Soviet Union. Uh, but the one who was kind of caught in the middle of all of this was Ethel Rosenberg. Most uh, experts even today believe that Ethel had nothing to do with all of this. Uh, many people back in the moment uh, questioned her involvement, but argued that, you know, that these are the people she uh, surrounded herself with. So she must have been somehow uh, involved. Uh, as it turns out, uh, that while Julius was a uh, communist uh, and, a, and a courier, while David Greenglass had, had done what he admitted, uh, later, uh, literally on his deathbed, Greenglass admitted that he had implicated Ethel as a way of throwing suspicion off of his own wife. So uh, clearly, Ethel Rosenberg had not really actually been involved in this. Now, to the question of what sort of information did these people actually, quote, provide the Soviet Union? Well, it turns out that a German scientist had provided the bulk of the information that the Soviets needed uh, in order to, uh, to complete the atomic bomb project. Uh, and what David Greenglass supplied to Julius Rosenberg was of very little consequence. Nonetheless, the Rosenbergs wound up being convicted of espionage and wound up being sentenced to death. So uh, this was a clear, uh, a clear moment uh, to American society, as, as many people in the moment saw it. It was a clear moment that said, here's the proof we needed that spies are abounding within the United States, and the result of this, this spying is going to be potentially catastrophic. So it turned the idea of what our security is. It turned the idea around of who we can trust and who we can't trust. Uh, sort of the hallmark moment, uh, the height of the paranoia of sorts, uh, is on June 25th, 1950, uh, when the United States actually got involved in the war, uh, in a civil war in Korea. On, this, on June 25th, 
North Korea invaded South Korea, marking the beginning of a three-year war over who was going to control the peninsula. And it turned the Cold War into a hot war and very nearly turned the, uh, the Cold War into a global war. So this is a transformational moment. Once again, we're talking about prior to the Korean War, the Cold War itself is just ideology. It's just back and forth about different types of, of thought about the post-war world. But now there's conflict. People are actually dying as a result of this. Uh, Seoul, South Korea fell very quickly to the no invading North Korean forces. Harry Truman went to the United Nations and very quickly uh, got approval to push back uh, the invading communist forces, and this war lasts until 1953. Uh, now, what's remarkable in the Korean War uh, from a statistical standpoint is the uh, American involvement in the Korean War was only three years. Uh, however, uh, um, as many American soldiers died in the Korean War as died in the Vietnam War, and civilian casualties were staggering in comparison uh, to the Vietnam War. It, um, uh, in some cases, uh, at least three times as many uh, by some accounting. So uh, it's really a, a very deadly war here. Uh, but what I think is more important uh, about the Korean War is how little Americans actually know about it. Uh, most Americans, our knowledge of the Korean War uh, comes from the television series MASH. And since MASH is set in Korea, but it's really uh, politically, it's about the Vietnam War. What it means is, is that Americans just don't know that much about the Korean War, about the origins and why it actually happens, what its place in the Cold War hierarchy actually is. Tensions had actually been escalating bet uh, between the United States and the Soviets since World War II. Uh, I've mentioned this on multiple occasions, so that should be obvious, it should be clear to you that this has been a problem. Uh, Korea, the Korean Peninsula was one of these areas where you had a lot of people who were native to that area who wanted to buy into this idea of independence, of nationhood. Uh, and they hoped that uh, people in the Korean Peninsula hoped that there would be an independent Korea. Now, post -war, or during the end of World War II, North Korea, or what becomes North Korea, was occupied essentially by the Soviet Union and what was occupied or what became South Korea was occupied by the United States. So the plan was, or the hope was, is that there would be some plan that comes about that reunites North and South Korea under Korean, the, Korea, the uh, idea of an independent, self-determined Korea, okay? Now, it doesn't wind up happening that way. For several months, uh, the United States had argued that South Korea or the Korean Peninsula in general was not part of, quote, the U.S. defense perimeter, as the Secretary of State Dean Acheson said, uh, put it. So since Acheson said over and over again that Korea is not part of the United States' defense perimeter, the Soviet Union took this as a sort of green light to pursue this unification of Korea on their terms, as opposed to uh, Korean self-determination or uh, U.S. involvement uh, in the region. And Stalin wound up, give, Joseph Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union, ended up giving his approval for North Korea to invade South Korea. For the first three months of all of this stuff, it does not look good uh, for the uh, South Koreans. And here you can see a map of uh, North and South Korea where they uh, where they are in relation to China, uh, where they are in relation to Japan. So they're clearly, the Korean Peninsula is clearly an important part of the Cold War, uh, of the Cold War ide ideas and ideologies. Uh, the United States really couldn't do much to stop the advance of North Koreans into South Korea. And it looked like uh, South Korea was simply not, as a nation, was not going to last. Uh, ultimately, what wound up happening was, is Douglas MacArthur wound up coming up with this tactic of landing forces behind, U.S. forces behind North Korean positions and kind of trapping the North Koreans into these areas, but also leaving them an escape route so that their only, their only option was they could not push forward. Their only option was to escape back uh, northward up the peninsula. So that's what the North Korean army 
forces actually wound up doing. And they just kind of played this game up, up the peninsula where the North Korean position would move up. MacArthur would land troops behind it. They would escape northward. MacArthur would land troops again behind it, and they would escape northward until finally they were back up above the 38th parallel, which marked that boundary between North and South Korea. Uh, and for those of you who are interested in military history and all of that, uh, I am grossly oversimplifying all of this stuff. Uh, so, you know, don't worry, you're not going to need to know the names of battles and troop movements and all that sort of stuff. This is more about the ideology and what North Korea and South Korea mean to the Cold War. Now, what winds up causing the problem and making this even more explosive of a problem in the Cold War is that Douglas MacArthur uh, made a decision uh, to pursue unification by invading North Korea. So essentially, the United States is now saying, well, now we're going to pursue unification. This was problematic because a lot of American policymakers believed that the United Nations mandate, which the U.S. had, the U.S. had a clear mandate from the United Nations to go in and save South Korea. But many believed that the U.N. mandate was simply to push the North Korean forces back above the 38th parallel, which they did. They got that that far. So at that point, many believed the mission's over. There is no need to be here. There was no clear statement that unification should be pursued. So why on earth would Douglas MacArthur do this? Why would he go in and say, well, now that we've achieved these victories, now we're going to push backward uh, or push forward, and we're going to continue pushing the North Koreans back until there is no such thing as North Korea? Well, very simply, Harry Truman at the bottom of the screen here, the commander in chief, gave him orders that were as clear as mud, essentially. MacArthur was told, regardless of what the UN mandate is, regardless of what our public statements are, if you believe that you can pursue North Korean unific or unification with North Korea, meaning you can invade North Korea and beat them, if you believe you can do that without getting China to intervene in this fight, then by all means, pursue the attack, pursue an invasion of North Korea. Now, MacArthur truly believed he had that position. He believed that he could invade North Korea and the Chinese would not get involved in this fight. Now, once again, I want to go back for a second here. Look where North Korea is in relation to China. So when MacArthur gets to that 38th parallel and says, we're pushing forward and we're going to get rid of North Korea, essentially, clearly the Chinese felt that they would be threatened. And despite what MacArthur's actions are, China clearly announced that if MacArthur passed the border between North and South Korea, that 38th parallel, they said if Truman pass, excuse me, MacArthur passes the 38th parallel, we'll have no choice but to invade North Korea ourselves as a defensive measure. We will see it as a matter of national security. We will have to do it. MacArthur simply ignored this. MacArthur just did not believe it was possible for China to do this. So he ignored the warnings, pursued beyond the 38th parallel, and then as kind of seemed predictable here, Literally hundreds of thousands of Chinese forces poured across the border uh, with, uh, between China and North Korea. And the circumstances of the United States military uh, in North Korea uh, wound up becoming untenable. The United States' 8th Army Division was actually uh, what was in North Korea at this point. They got surrounded and cut off by the Chinese. This was, uh, in, they were in real trouble. Uh, and what winds up happening here is MacArthur makes this situation worse. MacArthur demanded that the United States unleash its full military arsenal on North Korea and China, which would mean a huge expansion of the war because unleashing the full military arsenal on this fight very simply means the use of atomic weaponry in this war. Uh, and that was 
bad. This was uh, this would be a huge expansion, and virtually everybody was against this idea except Douglas MacArthur. Now, kind of uh, making this even trickier was that MacArthur and Truman were involved in a dispute over who actually has control of the so-called nuclear button, who determines when nuclear weapons are used. Douglas MacArthur believed that as the uh, that the army actually had this. Now, MacArthur was not the highest ranking military officer uh, in the United States military structure, but the chief of staff, uh, excuse me, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a guy named Omar Bradley was. Uh, and Omar Bradley sided with Harry Truman. Omar Bradley argued that the president of the United States is the commander in chief of armed forces. And therefore it follows logically that Harry Truman, the president, would have the power to do this. So he, the president believes he's got the power. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff has essentially backed up that it's his opinion that that's correct. Uh, and then Omar Bradley went a step farther, further in all of this by saying of MacArthur's demand, he said, quote, this is the wrong war at the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong enemy in terms of using uh, nuclear weapons. So it was not going to happen. MacArthur continued his demands, and ultimately, MacArthur wound up being fired by Harry Truman. Uh, he wound up being removed from command uh, in, in Korea and replaced with another general named Matthew Ridgway. Now, Matthew Ridgway essentially uh, reversed the position uh, of the United States Army by doing essentially the same thing that MacArthur had done, except this time uh, he winds up doing it in reverse. He's moving down uh, the, the, the Korean peninsula and going in and landing troops behind Co North Korean and Chinese positions to create escape valves uh, and escape positions for the United States Army. And ultimately the United States Army, the Eighth Army does wind up getting down below the 38th parallel and the Korean War winds up being this massive war of attrition over who's going to control the 38th parallel, who's going to control the border area. And over the course of the next three years, there's going to be some advancement on the part of the North Koreans, some advancement on the part of the South Koreans. But in the end, the total mileage is only about 12 miles. So they're fighting over all of this, all of this territory. And the movement is only about 12 miles. Finally, in 1953, the Korean War actually, quote, ends. Now, it doesn't end with a peace treaty. It doesn't end uh, with any sort of formal uh, agreement between any of the sides. The only thing that the two sides agreed to was a cessation of hostilities, an armistice. That's it. There is no formal peace treaty. That's why the United States still has active forces in Korea. That's why there's still that demilitarized zone between North Korea and South Korea that essentially nobody uh, can go into. It's a, so it's literally referred to uh, as no man's land and all of this. Uh, so there is no formal end to the Korean War, but the Korean War was still very important. It was filled with a lot of lessons, both for policymakers and American society. One big lesson that the Korean War demonstrated was that the United States was committed fully to stopping the spread of communism, period, no matter where it actually is. Prior to the Korean War, again, I can't emphasize this enough, prior to the Korean War, Harry Truman was basically saying that Southeast Asia was not part of the United States' defense perimeter, but the Korean War changed this. Uh, Secretary of State Dean Acheson may have kind of pushed the United States into this, but once it's on, it's on. The United States is now clearly saying that all areas of the world are quote unquote vital from a strategic standpoint. The second problem or lesson of the Korean War is the difficulty of winning a war even under the best of circumstances. In the Korean War, the United States fought a fairly weak enemy uh, and had very strong support from its allies and from the United Nations. It had a monopoly on air power, it had a monopoly on sophisticated weaponry, and yet they still found it very difficult to subdue the North Korean military. It wound up being very difficult. 
The third lesson of the Korean War is the difficulty of fighting limited wars. The American way of war, so to speak, since the American Civil War had been what we referred to as total war uh, during, uh, during World War II. It was total war. In total war, it's everything's on the table. You use all aspects of your society to take on all aspects of the enemy's society to convince them that fighting this war is not worth the effort. Here, what's happening during the Korean War, something totally different. What's happening here is that the United States was fighting a limited war. And limited is exactly what it sounds like. Limited weaponry, limited objectives. Instead of saying the only outcome that's possible is an unconditional surrender, well, now you don't want an unconditional surrender. If objectives have been met, that's it. That means the end of the fighting. And limited wars are also for what it's worth, they're very unpopular. The public rarely understands the purpose. The military has problems with it because even though in some cases it's easy to fulfill their objectives, it's also difficult to try to figure out what a victory looks like. Even in fulfilling those limited objectives, sometimes victory doesn't really look like victory. So very few people actually like the idea of limited wars. So why do we switch to a limited war? Why do we switch from the idea of total war to limited war? Well, very simply, nuclear weapons are what causes this. Now, a country that possesses nuclear weapons does have the actual ability to completely annihilate their enemy. So if you pursue, quote unquote, total war, it simply follows that, well, if they're not going to, if they're not going to give up under all of these other circumstances, here's what we can do to completely annihilate them and end this war. Nobody wants that because everybody understands after 1949 that if the United States drops the atomic bomb for str whatever strategic reasons, then the Soviet Union is going to do the same thing and vice versa. So one, there's no such thing as a quote unquote limited nuclear war. So Limited war is the new norm, but nobody really likes the new norm. Lesson number four is something that is referred to in political circles as the tail wagging the dog. The United States, over the course of the Korean War, truly believed that they could do whatever they wanted uh, in this area and get South Korea to do all of the heavy lifting. That the United States would set up would set up tactics and strategy. South Korea would carry them out. On the other, in, in terms of what actually happens, it's the other way around. The United States is the one that is taking the direction from the South Koreans. The South Koreans are setting tactics. They're the ones who are saying, this is what we want. And the United States is the one that's going out and doing all of this. And then the last lesson, this is more of a political lesson for Harry Truman. The last lesson is do not lose a war during your presidency, or at least appear to be losing a war. Harry Truman was, under the Constitution, entitled to run for re-election in 1952. But because of how things looked in South Korea, or in uh, Korea generally, uh, because of the, appeared, uh, the uh, apparent bogged down conditions, the Democratic Party flat out told Truman, we're not going to nominate you. Don't run for re-election because there is no way we are going to nominate you. So this was tough. Uh, Truman, you know, loses the presidency as a result of this. The Korean War, therefore, is a pivotal part of the Cold War. It had turned the Cold War hot. It demonstrated the United States' commitment to be the quote-unquote world's police, if you will. But even as this is occurring, there's something else developing, something that U.S. policymakers generally missed, even though it's right there in front of them. Okay, and I spoke to this when I talked about Koreans wanting an independent Korea that they have self-determined. Okay, something that's going on here that virtually everyone was missing was what's called third world nationalism. Third world nationalism in the 1940s and 1950s a development that very few people suspected was going to happen, happened. And virtually every policymaker, again, virtually all 
sides ignored this idea of the development of nationalism in the so-called third world. And here we have to start out with some definitions, primarily so we know what we're all talking about when we say, quote, third world. It's a term that's just kind of loosely tossed around today. But third world does actually have some very specific definitions. There is a political definition that applies mostly to the Cold War era. The political definition of third world was anything that was not the Soviet Union or the United States and their primary allies. So the first world, since the United States is the one kind of coming up with this terminology, the first world is the United States and their primary allies. Second world is the Soviet Union and their primary allies. And then everybody else, people who have not made a decision whether to be with the United States or the Soviet Union, those areas are referred to as, quote, third world. There's an economic definition of third world. And these last two definitions, these are what people use today uh, for the most part when they're tossing around the phrase third world, uh, is the economic and ideological definitions. An economic definition for third world is any country that is not economically self-sustaining or is in need of industrialization. So if a country hasn't industrialized, if they are not capable of creating a self-sustaining economy, if they're constantly in need of loans for development and that sort of thing, then that country is referred to from an economic perspective as a third world country. And then there's an ideological definition of third world. And that ideological definition is, quote, or is any need or any country that is perceived as, quote, needing modernization. Now, that's a tricky term. Needing modernization uh, is one that can be lo very loosely applied. You can have countries that are very, very much capable of economic self being economically self-sustained. But if they seem to have some, quote, unquote, backward ideologies, then they're going to be considered to be, quote, ideologically third world. So places like Afghanistan, uh, before uh, the, US, the uh, U.S. and their allies invaded uh, during the war on terror, uh, Saudi Arabia and much of the Arabic world is frequently referred to as third world, even though they are, they are incredibly wealthy uh, from an ideological standpoint, some have referred to them as third world uh, parts of the country. Now, again, understand that these are American definitions of these terms. Other countries uh, don't refer to themselves as, quote, third world countries. They don't look at themselves and go, hey, we're, we're a third world country. What, what can we do? These are definitions that are essentially imposed uh, by the United States and, uh, and their allies in the Western world generally. Now, third world, this third world when combined with the idea of nationalism, can become an explosive problem, potentially. Nationalism is a very powerful ideology. It represents a commitment to independence, an anti-colonial sentiment. And by the 1950s, it had grown into a major force in places like India, in Pakistan, in Algeria, throughout Africa, throughout Latin America, throughout Eastern Europe, throughout Southeast Asia, all of these areas are places where we're seeing these countries saying, no more, no more colonial domination. We want to be independence, independent. And this is where the cold world is going to flare the hottest. Not so much in Europe, where there's obvious potential conflict points between the US and the Soviet Union. It's in the third world where millions of people die. And here, we're going to have to deal with a paradox for the United States. There's been, there's been not one year since World War II where there has been, quote unquote, peace outside of Europe, out around, around the rest of the world, throughout Asia, throughout Africa, throughout the Middle East, throughout South America. There has been constant warfare, civil war and otherwise. Uh, guerrilla wars, terrorism, social conflict, however you want to refer to it, it's been going on literally every year since World War II. Most of these types of wars came in the form of countries that were struggling for who's going to be in control. Sometimes it's about independence from colonial rule, but they became transformed into civil wars. 
They might become civil wars by virtue of ethnic conflicts. They might become civil wars uh, by virtue of religious conflict or, you know, uh, things like that. But sometimes it has been a question over which side do we support in this so-called Cold War? Do we support a sort of U.S. version of society, a, uh, a capitalistic, quote-unquote, democratic Republican model, or we, do we support other types of models? During the Cold War, do we support the Soviet model? The central question for the United States is very simple. What do we do? How do we support or who do we support? And what we're going to find for the United States, this is where the conflict, the ideological conflict comes in to play. The United States' goal in this era is going to be principally supporting anti-communist regimes and pro-U.S. regimes. This idea that the United States will support anti-communist and pro-U.S. regimes, regardless of what other things they're doing, is called the Cold War ethos. And this Cold War ethos is the guiding principle for all of the stuff the United States does from a foreign policy standpoint. And unfortunately, what this means is, is that for the United States, it doesn't matter whether a regime is corrupt, whether that regime happens to be repressive, whether they deny civil rights or human rights or whatever. If that regime comes out and says flat out, we are anti-communist, and we are pro-U.S., then the United States will defend that nation. They will put that nation in a sort of uh, list of priority. Now, the first place the United States is going to try this out, where this is going to be employed, is going to be in Iran. World War II was fueled by Texas oil. This was uh, just sort of a, a, a simple fact of how we fought World War II. World War II was driven by Texas oil, it was fueled by it, and it rapidly depleted uh, the U.S.'s domestic reserves. Uh, the government actually, the U.S. government actually predicted that unless new sources were found, the United States' entire domestic oil reserve would be tapped out by 1960. So it was pretty clear that the United States uh, and others needed to find new sources of oil. And they knew where the oil actually was. The sources had actually been discovered well before World War II. It was a question of how do we get to those oil reserves? How do we tap those oil reserves, so to speak? Uh, and these sources were generally found uh, in the Middle East, in particular in Saudi Arabia and in present-day Iran. Now, during World War I, there was something that was developed, and we'll come back to this slide here in a second. There was something developed called the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, or uh, the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, as it was called uh, after World War II. The Anglo-Iranian Oil Company wound up extracting the oil from the, present, the area of present-day Iran, courtesy of a concession that was created by the British government. The British were the colonial rulers of this era, of this area, area, excuse me, the colonial rulers of that area. So they were the ones granting the concessions. They were the ones saying, you can come in and you can drill oil here. Uh, after World War II was over, Iran was independent. They elected a prime minister named Mohammad Mossadegh. And Mossadegh's platform was very simple the newly anointed Anglo-Iranian oil company was going to have to change. Iran's oil industry, as Mossadegh saw it, should benefit the Iranians. Now, what he favored was a split of the oil fields, the oil revenue, to the tune of 50-50. Okay? He was well aware that other companies were coming in courtesy of the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company or the Anglo-Iranian Oil Corp, that other entities were coming in, it was simply a matter of the Iranian people have to benefit from this. So he said, if the, if the Iranians don't benefit, if we don't get this 50-50 split, what we will do 
is we will nationalize the oil fields. The nation of Iran will nationalize the oil fields. We will run them as an entity of the Iranian government, and we will basically use the proceeds from those oil fields to run the nation of Iran. Now, as a consequence, uh, the Anglo-Iranian oil company cried foul over this. Uh, they uh, went to the British government. The British government called for a boycott of any oil that comes out of Iran if Iran were to nationalize these fields. Uh, they went both, both Britain and the AIOC went before the international courts uh, claiming that the oil was stolen from them. Uh, and the court rejected this position and said that what Mossadegh was doing was perfectly legal under international law. So you've got this crisis point. You've got a tipping point here where the British are looking at Iran and saying that our interests have been, uh, have been hurt. They've, this has all been detrimental to us. And the Iranian government saying, OK, but the previous uh, agreement was detrimental to us. We need to find a middle ground. It's at this point that the United States steps in as what they referred to, the negotiators referred to themselves as, quote unquote, an honest broker. And what they meant by this was, is that the United States didn't actually have a dog in this fight. The United States was not really involved in any way in Iran. Ultimately, the American negotiators came to the conclusion that there is no other settle, there's no settlement possible here. Both sides are too entrenched. And the simplest way to do this would be to eliminate the present Iranian government. Uh, the two people who were sent in uh, by the United States uh, to do this, to affect this, were Kermit Roosevelt, the grandson of Theodore Roosevelt, and Norman Schwarzkopf Sr. And their goal, their task, very simply, was to engineer a coup in Iran uh, to remove Mohammad Mossadegh uh, from power so that he would not be able to carry out nationalizing the oil fields. Now, what they did, they argued, uh, they put out part as part of all of this uh, attempt to uh, topple the regime. They put out a narrative. They put out all sorts of statements about how Mossadegh was using uh, the word nationalization and nationalization was a code word for communism, that this was a problem, that he had rejected realistic uh, that he had re rejected realistic efforts at trying to fix this problem. For example, they uh, announced that the United States announced an $85 million aid package to Iran, and Mossadegh had rejected that. Well, the United States stepped in and offered that $85 million aid package to the traditional ruling, uh, to the traditional rulers of Iran, a group of people who were referred to as the Shahs. And the Shahs accepted this, and they accepted conditions uh, of toppling Mossadegh's government, that the Shah, the kings, essentially, of Iran, would be placed in charge of Iran, they'd get the oil, uh, they'd get the $85 million aid package, and they'd also be responsible for creating a new oil consortium and creating something called the Baghdad Pact. The Baghdad Pact uh, would be something that would be a collective security agreement for the Middle East. So now the United States is involved in NATO. They're involved in the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, that ANZUS arrangement, and now the Baghdad Pact to create collective security in the Middle East. Uh, now, they also, the United States also uh, portrayed Mossadegh as a communist for another reason. And for that, we're going to have to go back to that initial map that we looked at. Iran obviously had massive oil reserves, but they also directly bordered the Soviet Union. And the United States clearly feared that the Soviet Union would in some way get access or want access and get access to oil reserves that were in their border areas. But what allowed them to, what allowed the United States to paint Mossadegh as a communist, in addition to all of this nationalization stuff was, is that the people in Iran, when they got together and, uh, and voted on their new parliament, the people in this northern part of Iran here, these people up here, because of their proximity to the Soviet Union, 
they had a lot of similar po political beliefs and they voted for people who were members of the Socialist Party in that region. Mossadegh, when he talked about having uh, the new parliament meeting in Tehran, he said, well, this is a people's legislature. This is the people are the ones who vote on this. If the people have voted for these legislators, we have no choice but to seat them in the national legislature. That's a very democratic way of looking at these things. And yet, because these people were socialists, because they were, quote, communists, the United States looked at this and said, well, you're willing to hold hands with communists, communists so you must be a communist sympathizer yourself. So the United States looked at Iran as being one of those potential falling dominoes because of things like the amount of oil that was there, the the uh, location, the proximity to the Soviet Union. They looked at it and said, there's a potential problem here. But what Iran also had that made it, uh, that made it a target for the United States to say, look, we can step in and save this, is the people, the population of Iran. It's the largest country in the region. So the population would allow them, uh, would allow Iran to have a massive army uh, to kind of keep the Soviet Union at bay if push came to shove. That's why engaging in things like the Baghdad Pact became a big part of how we install a new government. So in the aftermath of this attack, the, or the removal of Mossadegh, Operation Ajax, Ajax the United States aided Iran's uh, new traditional or their traditional monarchy. Uh, they they, they reemerged. They're the leaders. Uh, the United States gave them the $85 million aid package. The new prime minister created a new oil consortium that was called the Iranian Oil Participants Limited. Uh, and Iran got 40% of the revenue. Uh, and I'm not going to test you on these, but I'm, I'm just kind of giving you this for background information. Iran got 40% of the proceeds uh, of Iranian oil. Gulf Oil got 8%. Shell got 14%. Uh, French Petrol... The French petrol company got 60 per, or 6%, and a company called Iran, Aramco, uh, which was Standard Oil of California, Standard Oil of New Jersey, Standard Oil of New York, and Texaco, they all got 8% each. So there's this massive, there's this new massive consortium with a lot of American oil companies getting a piece of the action in Iran. The Shah turned out to function very well as an ally for the United States. When Arab nations and OPEC uh, embargoed oil to the United States in the 1970s uh, because, of the, uh, the, uh, because of the US's connections to Israel, Iran rejected that uh, embargo and continued to sell oil to the United States out of defiance. Now, on top of that, uh, Iran also wound up buying millions of dollars worth of weapons from the United States. Uh, the United the, uh, the Shah himself created one of the most repressive regimes across the uh, across the globe. Uh, however, what he also stated very clearly was, we're going to keep the parliament here, but there will never be communists sitting on that uh, in that uh, that parliament. So we're going to have no communists here, and we will clearly be a solid pro-U.S. regime. So. Iran worked perfectly within that Cold War ethos. The next area we're going to see this playing out, this Cold War ethos, is in Guatemala. Guatemala was and is one of the chief sources of bananas in the United States. Uh, I'm not going to suggest to, the, to you that the United States fought a Cold War, uh, quote unquote, over bananas. Uh, but the companies that are involved here uh, are the companies that are involved in the trade of bananas. So it's really they're really kind of a critical part to all of this. Guatemala was, uh, was dominated uh, by a company called United Fruit Company at this point. Uh, the United Fruit Company, through a series of mergers and the like, uh, wound up ultimately becoming Chiquita Banana, the Chiquita Banana Corporation. Uh, and United Fruit Company was very much uh, a power player in Guatemala. They didn't just own banana plantations. They owned 
80% of all of the land in Guatemala. They owned virtually all of the port facilities. So that means that every bit of trade that comes in and goes out of Guatemala, United Fruit Company got a piece of the action on this. Uh, they owned virtually every radio station in Guatemala as well. So they controlled information. So the joke that went around, and it wasn't really a joke, it was more reality than anything else. But the joke that went around during this era was that Guatemala was a subsidiary of the United Fruit Company. Now, this obviously didn't make a lot of Guatemalans happy. A lot of Guatemalans were impoverished. They owned virtually no land. Uh, they had elected in the shadow of World War II uh, a president who supported land reform, uh, but the land reform really kind of never went anywhere. So his vice president wound up being elected in his place. And his vice president, Jacobo Arbenz, had a much more radical land reform program. Now, land reform is one of these things that for many people in the United States became sort of a code word for communism, nationalization, and land reform, these are all things that people hear these phrases and go, oh, my God, that's, that's communism. We've got to stop all of that. Uh, however, Arbenz wasn't much of a communist. What Arbenz wanted to do in terms of land reform was he wanted to take what was called uncultivated or unimproved land and use that for redistribution. Now, how the redistribution was going to happen, Arbenz wasn't going to just, quote, seize this land. He wasn't going to take it away from anybody. What the government was going to do was they were going to look at the tax valuations. They were going to look at what these people who owned land, this unimproved land, what they were paying in terms of taxes to say, OK, this is what this land is worth. And then the government was going to appropriate money and pay people the value of their land. So they weren't literally going to steal it. Essentially, what they were engaging in was eminent domain which is something we do in the United States all of the time without people worrying about being called communists. So Arbenz is not really much of a communist in that regard. However, here's where it gets tricky, especially for the United Fruit Company. Despite owning 80% of the land in Guatemala, the United Fruit Company regularly paid less than $100,000 annually in taxes. And the reason for this was very simple. They had been consciously undervaluing the land. Now, this is one of those things that when you get involved in, you know, bookkeeping trickeration, if you will, that this can come back to bite you. And it did. It came back to bite uh, the United Fruit Company. But the United Fruit Company wasn't just any company in that regard. They weren't just a typical corporation. The United Fruit Company had very strong connective ties to the United States government. The former president of the United Fruit Company was a guy named Alan Dulles. And Alan Dulles, upon leaving the United Fruit Company, became the head of the United States CIA. The U.S. Secretary of State was Alan's brother, a guy named John Foster Dulles. Uh, prior to becoming uh, the Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles was chief counsel for the United Fruit Company. So the United Fruit Company looked at the United States government and said, we have clear allies in the government. We have people who will support us. So when Arbenz starts talking about all of this reformist stuff, United Fruit Company went to these allies and said, look, you've got to stop this. We cannot allow this to happen. And the Dulles brothers sprung into action. They absolutely came in to save uh, the United Fruit Company here. Uh, first thing the, United, the U.S. did, uh, the CIA planted uh, Soviet weapons in Guatemala and then announced the, quote, discovery of these Soviet weapons as, quote, unquote, proof that the Soviets were there, that they were ready to intervene uh, in Guatemala. Uh, the CIA then started bombing Guatemala using planes that had been painted to look uh, like Soviet planes. Uh, they also uh, wound up having uh, battle noises played over uh, the radios. Uh, since the United Fruit Company owned virtually all of the radio stations and the information distribution, it was really easy to make it sound as if Guatemala was under attack by the Soviet Union as a way of consolidating power. Now, the person who was behind all of this stuff 
was Edward Bernays, the same guy, the same Edward Bernays that I talked about during World War I, who came up with a propaganda campaign to kind of push women back into the domestic sphere. By the 1950s, he's working in the U.S. State Department in terms of how we can propagandize foreign policy. So this is one of the ways that the United States is doing this. Operation PB Success, as it became known, uh, wound up doing all of these things. The uh, kind of the most farcical part of all of this uh, was that those planes that had been dropping bombs also wound it up wound up uh, dropping quote unquote paratroopers uh, into Guatemala. They weren't actually paratroopers; uh, they were dummies that had that were being parachuted in. Uh, but it looked for all the world like Guatemala was under attack by the Soviet Union because what Arbenz was doing was failing. So the Soviet Union had no choice but to step in and forcibly do what Arbenz was trying. In Operation PB Success, Arbenz actually uh, wound up stepping aside. Uh, the United States State Department always claimed in their documentation uh, that they did not overthrow Arbenz. Arbenz stepped aside. But Arbenz also, it's, also, it's very clear, he stepped aside to avoid bloodshed. He flat out said, if all of this will stop because I resign, then fine, I'll resign, I'm, I'll get out. Uh, but Arbenz uh, clearly believed the situation was futile. The United States immediately recognized the government of his successor, a, uh, a military colonel named uh, Carlos Castillo Armas. Uh, John Foster Dulles, once recognizing uh, Enrique, uh, Carlos Enrique Castillo Armas, and on recognizing him, said that quote, Guatemalans have solved their problem. They've pushed the Soviets back and they've solved the problem of communism within their country. Armas very quickly reversed all of the Arbenz land reforms. He banned labor unions. He banned books by Russian authors uh, like Fyodor Dostoevsky. He even banned uh, books by American authors like Henry David Thoreau because the thought was that guys like Thoreau had too much of a communistic bent to him. Uh, and uh, Armas instituted uh, yet another sort of reign of terror uh, in Guatemala. Uh, Armas himself, however, wound up being unable to contain uh, this, uh, this unrest. Uh, and when he proved uh, incapable of that, uh, Armas himself wound up being assassinated. And assassination became sort of the, uh, the solution to all of the problems uh, in Guatemala. Guatemala, as I recall, has had something... Uh, something like 35 governments since 1970. It's been uh, a very uh, unstable place in that regard. And the instability traces itself back uh, to this era. Now, what's going on here uh, in Guatemala? Obviously, corporate concerns were very, very much in the forefront of these things with what the United Fruit Company wanted. Uh, and those corporate concerns dovetailed with what the United States wanted. They did not want nationalization policies. The United States didn't want countries coming in and engaging in land reform and taking over uh, various industries. There were hemispheric concerns that played out uh, in the Guatemala, uh, in the country of Guatemala, like the uh, so-called Monroe Doctrine and the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. The United States stoked all of this uh, by sending those planes in, saying that these were Soviets uh, who were invading when none of that was actually going on. Uh, and then again, the Cold War ethos, taking out a leader who was doing things that were communist-ish, if you will, and supporting a regime that was very clearly pro-US and anti-communist, even while it was incredibly repressive. So the United States was once again willing to say, we're going to put aside all of these other ideals that we have in return for this support of anti-communism and pro-U.S. concerns. Now, the 1950s is a period that is remarkable for the United States. It's an era where communism dominated uh, American society, and it became it got brought home in many other ways. Uh, a, a number of ways. We talked about these in the last lecture, but it got brought home in a very tangible way during the 1950s in something called that second Red Scare that I talked about, uh, or McCarthyism. In 1950s, uh, 
uh, America was very much marked by this McCarthyism. Uh, the period's named after a senator from Wisconsin named Joseph McCarthy. He was known for destroying careers on a whim. Uh, he was very charismatic. He was a demagogue. Uh, he had a very good story growing up. Uh, he had grown up on a farm in complete poverty. This poverty forced him to leave school early, but eventually he went back and finished. Uh, he became the youngest judge in Wisconsin history. When Pearl Harbor uh, got attacked, uh, McCarthy joined the uh, United States Marines, fought in World War II, and after service, he, got, he returned home, got himself elected to the Senate. He uh, got himself uh, a Congressional Medal of Honor for what he uh, did in World War II, uh, which all sounds, this sounds like an incredibly great story. If you were to just look at this on paper and talk about Joseph McCarthy, he sounds fantastic. But there's an incredible dark side to all of this. It later turned out that with Joseph McCarthy, he had gotten his uh, Medal of Honor, uh, courtesy of a citation, where he himself forged his commanding officer's signature. Uh, it also turned out that McCarthy regularly cheated on his taxes, that he was an alcoholic, that he consistently violated campaign finance laws. Uh, so he had this really ugly side to him as well. Now, McCarthy was looking for an issue that he believed he could ride to the presidency. Sorry, I got a little touchy there with the, the movement of the, uh, the slides there. He was looking for an issue that he believed he could ride to the presidency, and he found it. Anti-communism was it. In a speech that was given before a women's auxiliary group, he held up a sheaf of papers and said, I have in my hand here a list that contains 205, quote, card-carrying members of the Communist Party who work in the United States government across all levels of security. Now, this turned out to be completely false. McCarthy had no such list. And I think it's worth pointing out here that at this particular moment, there were 4 million uh, U.S. governmental employees. So 205, that's a, that's a drop of spittle in a massive bucket. Uh, but even with McCarthyism uh, and the Red Scare uh, emerging here, Americans had this sort of have, I shouldn't say had, they have an inexplicable nostalgia for the 1950s. There's a myth that the 1950s were this nice, pleasant interlude between the violence of World War II and the cultural violence uh, and cultural upheaval of the 1960s. But this is simply not reality. Uh, there were fewer teens as a percentage of the population in the 1950s than ever before. But somehow, these people created virtually every aspect of what's understood as teen culture in the United States. What was critical about creating this teen culture in the United States was a, a multiracial aspect to it that in, Americans had never really seen before. Uh, for example, country and Western music came together uh, and fused with rhythm and blues in the Upper South to create an entirely new type of music, one with a new culture. Now, up until this point, in 1954, the most popular singer in this country was a guy named Perry Como. And don't get me wrong, I'm not about to tell you that Perry Como was in some way subversive. It's what he represents a sort of departure from. The number one song in the country was How Much Is This Doggy or How Much Is That Doggy in the Window. And that was just kind of representative of the older culture. But with that fusion of country and Western music, along with rhythm and blues, there's a whole new style of music that emerges called rock and roll. And with rock and roll came a whole new set of teen icons. Now people didn't want to be Perry Como. People turned to Elvis Presley. They turned uh, to Little Richard and Chuck Berry. Little Richard and Chuck Berry were breaking color barriers by playing to white audiences uh, and mixed race audiences as well. Uh, Buddy Holly was part of all of this stuff. Fats Domino was part of it. And a Cleveland DJ named Alan Freed threw Americans into a fit when he came up with the term for this new type of music. He called this new type of music, quote, rock and roll. Now, a lot of times people freak out 
about rock and roll. They freak out about rock music. And a lot of people have this assumption today that the fear is that it's noise pollution, this ACDC uh, countered. The ACDC said it ain't noise pollution. But that's what a lot of people fear. They think that, well, it's this awful stuff. It's loud and screeching guitars. That's not what terrified people. What terrified people was when Alan Freed called this rock and roll music, he was utilizing a piece of African-American slang. Rock and roll was African-American slang for sexual intercourse. So by basically saying this is rock and roll music, it's music that you rock and roll to, he was connecting this. There was a sexual connotation that he was very consciously making with this music. And it scared the hell out of older Americans. But it's also worth pointing out here that in addition to creating these new icons for the teenage population, uh, it split uh, teenagers amongst different types of, uh, of avatars. It also absolutely saved radio. Uh, television had been destroying radio up to this point. And I don't mean destroying it in terms of ratings. I mean literally destroying it. Te uh, shows that were very popular on radio, uh, soap operas, shows like Superman, The Lone Ranger, all of these had their roots in radio, but were migrating to television. So radio appeared to be dead. On top of all of that, if teenagers wanted to listen to this rock and roll music, they weren't going to listen to it on the big radio that the family gathered around to listen to the news or listen to War of the Worlds or all this other type of entertainment. Another factor that absolutely saved radio that happened in conjunction with these new teen icons was the development of the transistor radio. People could take their music and take it on the go. They could move with their music. This is, again, very important. This is no less revolutionary to the 1950s teenagers than things like iPods and iPhones are to today's youth. That you can take your entire music catalog is remarkable. That these people were able to actually take their music with them, tune into a radio station that played their type of music. This was something that generations could not have conceived of before. And it was very important uh, in saving uh, the industry of rock and roll, or excuse me, saving the radio industry. Now, the 1950s also saw the development of drive-in picture uh, theaters. Uh, by the 1960s, drive-ins outnumbered uh, regular inside, indoors sit-down movie theaters. Uh, the idea behind uh, a drive-in was that a family could actually go to the movies and not need a baby, babysitter. They could all just go in and take in the movie. Uh, however, what actually wound up happening, what happening was is that the drive-ins became sort of the uh, the playground of teenagers. They wound up being dominated by teenagers as teenagers flocked to this these areas. There were a lot of fears about this new teen culture that emerged. For a lot of people, the most important singer of the 1950s was Elvis Presley. And, uh, and Elvis Presley scared the hell out of American parents. The way he gyrated on TV, the way he sounded as if he himself were Black, the way that that type of music appealed to their teenagers. It's all happening on some level because teenagers are now all congregated in one place, school. For a half a century, Americans had been trying to get children out of the workforce and forcibly into these schools. And by the 1950s, they had succeeded. A majority of the kids were in school. A majority were graduating from high school. But the unintended consequence, if you will, is that these teens are coming together and creating independent, autonomous cultures that disturbed their parents rather than made their parents feel secure. So the image of the 1950s is a challenging one. It is one of this sort of, the images are ones of hula hoops and bunny hops and uh, Edsel's and tail fin Cadillacs, uh, the television shows like uh, the Howdy Doody show or in the center, uh, Kukla, Fran and Ollie and Father Knows Best. But this is all distortion. This is not 
what the 1950s were. The 1950s was a period of massive change in the United States. Now, there did grow a nostalgia for the 1950s, but it's a fairly recent trend in American history. No one in the 1960s was particularly nostalgic for the 1950s. It wasn't until the 1970s when movies like The Last Picture Show appeared, uh, followed by American Graffiti that celebrated the 1950s. These movies were followed by uh, television shows like Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley and Broadway musicals like Grease. All of these things suggested a time of innocence and more importantly, a time of innocence that has been lost. Uh, and all you have to do to see that this is nonsense on some level is to look at uh, the, the hero, if you will, uh, of Happy Days, uh, the hero, and more importantly, the quote, rebel of, ha of Happy Days. The, he the rebel of, the hap of Happy Days was Arthur Fonzarelli, the Fonz. Now, the Fonz, while he does wear a leather jacket, and rides a motorcycle, which is just kind of this scary, uh, almost uh, what was referred to as the greaser image of the 1950s, if you've ever seen Happy Days, think about what the Fonz actually does. Yes, he does ride a motorcycle. Yeah, he wears a leather jacket, but he also consistently stands up for his friends. He has a steady job. He pays rent. Sure, he dates a lot of women, but Mr. and Mrs. Cunningham can always find Arthur Fonzarelli when they need him. Mrs. Cunningham, in fact, never calls him uh, very rarely, I shouldn't say never, very rarely calls him Fonzie. She calls him Arthur by his given name. And he's all he himself is always respectful of Mr. and Mrs. Cunningham. He's never disrespectful to them. And then by the end of the series, he's absolutely as, as establishment as it gets. He becomes a teacher at high school. He becomes an auto shop teacher in high school. So he's hardly a rebel. Okay. And yet we have this idea. That he that rebels are like that, and that there was this other side to America that was really uh, kind of a uh, kind of a uh, a more wholesome place than it was. Now, the reality of the 1950s was about this second Red Scare and McCarthyism. Joseph McCarthy didn't actually start the Red Scare, but he became the primary beneficiary of this second Red Scare. It really began in the late 1940s when politicians discovered that anti-communism was an effective tool at stifling any sort of dissent in the United States. In understanding that anti-communism could stifle dissent, politicians used, and used communism as a label against any threat to the status quo. Labor unions, quote, liberals, equality, people who favored racial equality, people who favored uh, feminism. These were all people who could be targeted and painted as communists because they were challenging the status quo in the United States. Now, they also realized, uh, as we're going to talk about uh, in a couple of seconds, that uh, a similarly effective tool was to attack Hollywood as a bastion of left-wing extremism that attempted to indoctrinate through film. Uh, however, the Red Scare got its real beginnings uh, if you will, with an investigation into the loyalty of federal employees. Now, Joseph McCarthy may not have had the list of 205 quote-unquote card-carrying members of the Communist Party, but it did launch and it, it did result in an investigation being launched, and the investigation discovered quote-unquote 308 people who were fired as security risks. Now, in 1948, an obscure California congressman named Richard Nixon, he was then obscure, uh, uncovered the one documented case of quote unquote communist infiltration in the government. And that was the case of a man named Alger Hiss pictured on the screen. In 1948, the, mag the editor of Time Magazine, a guy named Whitaker Chambers, uh, who was himself a self-described former communist, announced in print that a former high-ranking State Department official had, quote, passed sensitive documents to him. Uh, Chambers claimed that he had stored the documents uh, via microfilm uh, 
in a pumpkin patch in Maryland. And then he gave the location to Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon then led this very showy uh, march out to these field, this pumpkin patch where he, quote, discovered the pumpkin and pulled this microfilm out of the pumpkin patch, kind of held it aloft and said, here we go, here we got, we've got it. Now, the question became, you know, what is Alger Hiss's involvement? Alger Hiss was accused of being the source of the microfilm, and he denied it. He denied any sort of wrongdoing. He was placed on trial, and over the course of his case, he wound up being found guilty of perjury, although he was not found guilty of any espionage. There was simply no way to prove whether Hiss had passed the documents on to Whitaker Chambers. It, that devolved into literally a he said, he said type of argument with no clear evidence that pointed to Alger Hiss's guilt or innocence. What prosecutors seized on in the Alger Hiss case was his vehement denial that he had ever been a communist. And it turned out that he had been. Uh, the Alger Hiss case became extremely important because it provided these bases for these wild claims of people like Joseph McCarthy, the people who thought that they could use communist infiltration uh, and go out and go after any sorts of people. So Hiss wound up, you know, being sort of the fall guy in all of this because he lied about whether he had been a member of the Communist Party or not. But in the aftermath of the Alger Hiss case, the United States made uh, the U.S. Congress uh, did two things from a legal standpoint. Uh, they passed something called the Smith Act, which made it a crime to call for the violent overthrow of the United States government. Uh, under this act, it would theoretically have made the Communist Party illegal in the United States by virtue of that one statement uh, of calling for the violent overthrow. Uh, the second uh, piece of legislation, the McCarran Act, uh, required so-called quote, communist front organizations to register with the United States government. So if a, gov if an, if a, if a charity, for example, had any ties to a communist regime or a communist party, they had to identify their political leanings to the United States government. And then the third thing that winds up happening is that Congress creates something called the House Un-American Activities Committee. This House Un-American Activities Committee is going to meet on multiple occasions uh, between, from, the, uh, from the late 1940s into the 1950s. Uh, but the, most, the two most important periods where they held hearings uh, were in 1948 and in 1953. It investigated Hollywood in order to root out communists. They called all sorts of actors and actresses to the, uh, to the, the hearings. Uh, they called directors, producers, writers, and they asked them a basic series of questions. Have you ever been a communist? Will you name the names of communists, of people who were communists? Uh, and if they complied, they were kind of sent on their way. If they refused to comply, they would be quote unquote blacklisted. Now, these hearings came under fire from a lot of people. Strangely enough, they came under fire from people like the FBI or groups like the FBI. The FBI had tons of information courtesy of people signing roll sheets when they went to Communist Party meetings in the 1930s. So the FBI knew all of these people who had already been members or former members of the Communist Party. This turned out to be a sort of ritual humiliation. So it produced nothing new of value other than this attempt to cause people to go out uh, and you know either name names or refuse to name names. Now, it worked ex almost exactly like the Salem witch trials on some level. Uh, if you confessed and you named names, you were acquitted or you were spared. But if you denied that you had ever been a communist or you refused to cooperate, uh, then again, you got blacklisted, you got the punishment. It's no coincidence that one of the people who was called to testify before the House Un-American Activities Committee and refused to participate, refused to name names or otherwise talk about his political backgrounds was a playwright named Arthur Miller. And Arthur Miller wrote The Crucible, 
based on his experiences. This was an allegory. He used the Puritans as an allegory for what was going on in the United States in the 1950s. Now, those who were blacklisted uh, included actors like on the previous page, I had Zero Mostel uh, and a director named Michael Curtis. Uh, they were blacklisted and it was strange. They wound up losing their jobs in the, in the film industry. They couldn't make Hollywood films, but strangely enough, a lot of these people wound up moving into the new medium of television and having way more influence than they had in the movies because what they did on television, uh, a lot of these blacklisted writers, for example, uh, wrote children's shows in the 1950s under pseudonyms. Now, one of the people who was called, there were two other people who testified that gave, in, gave some very interesting testimony here. Uh, one of those who was called was a director named Elia Kazan. Uh, one of the more famous directors in Hollywood. He was himself a former communist. And in front of the House on american Activities Committee, he admitted it. He said, yes, I was a member of the Communist Party. And then he named the names of a number of other prominent Hollywood people who were themselves former communists. Uh, when he did this, uh, he also wound up getting, when he got done uh, with the testimony, he wound up making a movie uh, called On the Waterfront. And On the Waterfront, was a, mo was a movie that was all about testifying before these types of groups. A, a dock worker uh, in the movie uh, testified before a committee on organized crimes. He got in, he admitted he was a member of an organized crime group, and he named the names of other gangsters. Uh, so it was uh, Ilya Kazan's effort to try to counter what Arthur Miller was saying, was that, you know, there, he Kazan was saying, there's no shame in all of this. There's no shame in going in and admitting who you were and naming the names of other people who were doing something that everybody, quote unquote, perceives as wrong. Strangely enough, Arthur Miller had an, an odd ally in all of this stuff in another Hollywood figure uh, who supported his testimony. That figure was Ronald Reagan. Now, at this point, Ronald Reagan was not a politician. There was no, I, there was no thought being given to him uh, running for president someday. He happened to be a member of the Screen Actors Guild. And when he appeared before the House on american Activities Committee, his testimony was, is that it probably does happen in Hollywood that people actually, that they actually engage in indoctrination, that they use it uh, to, uh, to try to create some sort of sense of what their politics are. And he said, but, you know, the right does this too. The right uses uh, films as propaganda as well. Uh, and he also addressed the question of asking, pol asking about political beliefs by saying that this is the United States. It's, you know, politics are personal. There's, you know, no it's nobody's business what party you belong to. So Reagan, in an odd way, wound up supporting Arthur Miller and not supporting the right on all of this stuff. Uh, but this testimony that Reagan gave, that Miller gave, that Kazan gave, these kind of marked the contentiousness of the 1950s. Now, another point of contention in the 1950s uh, was the just sheer amount that was being spent uh, on military uh, appropriations during this era. Uh, the 1950s was the, was the era of the creation of what people have referred to as the military industrial complex. And in, in, in our modern world, a lot of people throw around the phrase military industrial complex with uh, probably not really much of a reason to, to, uh, or understanding of what it actually means. Uh, but what underpinned this creation of the military industrial complex was something that uh, historians and economists have referred to as quote unquote military Keynesianism. Uh, now, if you remember back to uh, when we talked about the Great Depression, John Maynard Keynes suggested that one way for governments to spend money uh, to keep the country out of a, an economic downturn was for the government to spend, spend, spend during a downturn, that it would take public money, it would put it in private hands, and that it would keep the economy rolling. Now, what occurs in the 1950s was not true Keynesian economics. There was no downturn. But what there was was a massive amount of government spending, in particular in the defense industry. Uh, and 
they continued on what the government had been doing during World War II. Now, what, why it's called military Keynesianism is very simple. There are two ways that governments can actually spend money. One of them is on social programs or infrastructure, doing things like building schools, building hospitals, uh, building roads, uh, improvement of public, delivery, uh, public utilities delivery, or the government can spend money on the military, which produces massive amounts of spending on weapons, on armaments, on bombers. The idea behind military Keynesianism is a massive government jobs program in the form of the defense industry. And it was very successful. Uh, 40,000 workers were involved in the defense industry by the mid-1950s. Uh, and this winds up having long-term consequences for the United States. By the 1960s, more than half of the United States' uh, uh, budget expenditures went toward defense spending. So when people talk about the massive defense expenditures of today, it starts in this particular era. By the mid-1970s, the, the Department of Defense had more assets than the 75 largest corporations in the United States. What was being created, as one historian referred to it, was a permanent wartime economy to help maintain prosperity. Now, one person who actually had some misgivings about this was the president of the United States, and I'm sorry, I've got his picture over uh, some of the, uh, the text here. Uh, the president was Dwight Eisenhower, and Dwight Eisenhower had actually supported this notion of a massive military buildup. Uh, the reason was very simple, uh, or the reasons were very simple. He believed that military personnel uh, and military bases were incredibly expensive. Uh, and he also believed that in the long run, a missile-based defense system would actually be more economically successful than a personnel based defense system. And what I mean by a missile based defense system, he's not talking about creating some massive system that shoots out rockets or anything. He's just saying our base defensive strategy should revolve around having nuclear missiles that are capable of being deployed everywhere instead of deploying military personnel. Now, why people like Eisenhower believed this, why they believed that a missile based system was was more economically uh, viable than a personnel-based system was. Simply put, you don't have to clothe and feed and shelter and all of these other things that are associated with a personnel-based defense. Uh, you don't have to send people to college. You don't have to pay for VA, uh, for VA benefits. You don't have to pay for medical care. You don't have to pay for uh, you know, subsidized housing loans and all of that sort of stuff. So in the long term, people truly believed that it would be more economical to go behind to get behind uh, a missile-based defense system. Secondly, Eisenhower's military inner circle was convinced that the Soviets were building massive amounts of nuclear weapons, and they were, uh, and that the, what the United States needed to do was to keep up with this massive military buildup. So keeping up with and surpassing the Soviets would ensure that in the event of an, of an attack, uh, a nuclear attack, that the United States, even if they had gotten a lot of their weapons destroyed, they would still have an ability to respond on a large scale to a Soviet nuclear attack. This idea is called massive retaliation. Uh, and again, Eisenhower truly believed that this was more economical. Now, this whole idea, and I'm going to warn you here, this whole idea is driven by a crucially important document that you need to know about called NSC 68. The, the reason for the warning is on the next screen, you're going to see a massive amount of text. I've got all of these things up here for you as a way of saying, this is how broad based NSC 68 is. You don't need to quote, remember every single point of NSC 68. But NSC 68 is a document, National Security Council document 68. And it stated essentially all of these things that were about fighting the Cold War. Why, quote unquote, we're doing all of this stuff. It argued, for example, that the Soviets were bent on world domination. And thus the primary objective of the United States must be containment of the Soviet Union. It argued 
that the United States must embark on a massive armaments plan to keep up with the Soviet Union. And then it advocated a quote-unquote other course of action on the Cold War. So what you see after that third bullet point is a series of direct quotes from NSC 68. And just, just listen to these. First, a concerted attack on the problem of the United States' balance of payments. Essentially, what they were saying in NSC 68 was the United States cannot continue to be importing more than we are exporting. Otherwise, we are going to be in real trouble. So that's what this concerted attack on the balance of payments. In particular, what they're talking about is gold redemption. We don't want gold leaving the United States at the rate that it's been leaving. Development of programs designed to build and maintain confidence among other peoples in our strength and resolution and to wage overt psychological warfare calculated to engage, uh, to encourage mass defections from Soviet allegiance and to frustrate the Kremlin design in other ways. Intensification of affirmative and timely measures and operations by covert means in the fields of economic warfare and political and psychological warfare with a view to fomenting and supporting unrest and revolt in selected strategic satellite countries. So very clearly, the United States is saying we are going to involve, involve ourselves in covert operations. We're going to undermine economies. We're going to undermine governments. We're going to engage in psychological warfare. We're going to wage propaganda wars in order to undermine the Soviet Union. Quote, the development of internal security and civilian defense programs, quote, improvement and intensification of intelligence activities. And then the last one, quote, the reduction of federal expenditures for purposes other than defense and foreign assistance, if necessary, by the deferment of certain desirable programs. Now, what that means, this means that NSC 68 is saying, if the choice comes down to, the, the hope is that we can do both. But if the choice comes down to aid for dependent children, food stamps, or things like foreign assistance programs, like we give aid to a foreign country, that aid to foreign countries wins out. If it comes down to building hospitals and schools or missile defense programs, missile defense programs. If it comes down to uh, social security or it comes down to the latest bomber project, social security is gonna lose out, okay? So it's very clear that our defense needs are going to be more important than these, uh, than these desirable, quote unquote, social programs as they're putting it. In short, the United States is saying, we're gonna do whatever it takes to maintain a, a primacy over the Soviet Union. And it's clear in the entire document, in no part of the document does it ever say that this is about our moral outrage over communism. It's about maintaining American economic standing over the Soviet Union. Now, in keeping with this idea, these, this is all very clearly put out, and it's summarized best by one of the architects of this document and one of the architects of containment. Again, George Frost Kennan. The United States will do whatever it takes to maintain a status of primacy over the Soviet Union. And Kennan's own testimony before the uh, House when he summed up our goals, he said, quote, we have 50% of the world's wealth, but only 6.3% of the world's population. Our real task in the coming period is to devise a pattern of relationships that will allow us to maintain this disparity. That's it. It's not a moral outrage over communism. Nobody cares about that. It's about how do we make sure that we control these resources. So the United States is setting itself up to fight this Cold War on virtually every front, on a social front, on an economic front, on a, you know, from the standpoint of how the government plays all of this stuff out. It, this is why attacks on weak mindedness are so important. This is why drives toward conformity are so important. And nevertheless, there are a lot of things that are changing in the United States, uh, things that are going to run counter 
to what the United States wants from this standpoint of conformity. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, in 1954, rock and roll came to public attention. But by 1957, that first phase of rock and roll had already ended. All of the quote unquote icons of this era were gone. Elvis Presley had, and I don't mean like literally gone, but Elvis Presley was off in Europe. He had been drafted by the peacetime army and was, in, was stationed in Germany. Little Richard had converted to Christianity and sworn off rock and roll music. Uh, he said it was, quote, the devil's music, and he would never perform it again. Obviously, he changed his mind later. Uh, even guys like Jerry Lee Lewis, who were uh, very important in, uh, foundationally to rock and roll, uh, he was essentially banned from the radio, uh, from radio stations, uh, and the outrage was not over his music. The outrage was is that he had married his cousin, and, oh, his cousin happened to also be 13 years old. So uh, he was just considered way too immoral, even by rock and roll standards uh, for this. Now, record companies understood the importance of rock music, and they tried to create new icons for this. But that youth culture that I talked about that was so important in this era, the youth culture actually created the new icons. It was not the record companies that did this. The new icons, since a lot of men were being sent off to this military and, you know, in this peacetime draft like Elvis, the second phase of rock and roll music was a phase that is referred to as, quote, the girl band phase, because it was young women who were going to be the icons of rock music during this era. Uh, they proved to be no less dangerous than uh, their earlier uh, their earlier counterparts like Elvis and Little Richard, Fats Domino and Jerry Lee Lewis. For example, you've got Martha and the Vandellas, the Shirelles, the Supremes. They are all, first of all, women, which is on some level kind of scary within rock music that women are coming to the forefront and saying, we're not going to be, these, these are not women who represent the so-called domestic sphere. They're also all African-American, which means that the uh, the listenership the when these people go out and play uh, play play concerts to their live audiences those audiences are going to be uh, racially mixed but they're also remember there was there was a fear in rock and roll music the term itself rock and roll music it was a sexual slang well that becomes even more clear and causes a lot of people uh, a lot of uh, a lot of problem when the songs that these women are singing start getting released, like, Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow, which was written by Carol King, uh, but made very famous uh, by the Shirelles. Tonight, I mean, just read the lyrics about all of this. It is very clearly about whether these people should engage in sexual intercourse or not. So when fathers are hearing songs that are, quote, for rock and roll purposes, they're already terrified. But now they're hearing their daughters sing about rock and roll. So this second phase of rock and roll, this girl band phase, was just as dangerous, if not more dangerous, to the American mindset than the early phases were. But there were some other major changes that were heading to the United States uh, as well. Uh, there was a very important case uh, that hit the Supreme Court called the Roth case, Roth versus United States. Samuel Roth was a self-described smut peddler and had been sentenced to 25 years in jail for sending obscene material through the mail. But his appeal uh, of his uh, sentence to the Supreme Court uh, wound up resulting in his conviction being overturned. The court ruled that only, qu that, quote, only a work without socially redeeming value may be censored. Now, what does that mean? Only a work without socially redeeming value may be censored. In practice, what it meant was is that works could no longer be banned on the basis of a single word or a single paragraph or a single scene like in movies. A work had to be evaluated in its entirety rather than taking one little thing out of context and going, oh, see, that's a dirty word. We can't have that. And more importantly, it ruled, the Supreme Court ruled, that it must be evaluated using contemporary standards. You can't use 
standards from, say, the 1920s or the 1870s. This effectively undid the Comstock Act. And among the things that challenged this, uh, Hare uh, challenged it. Censorship boards had existed uh, all across the country and were censoring uh, virtually everything. The New York State Censorship Board uh, attempted to ban the musical Hair uh, because it had full frontal nudity, uh, but it failed because as it was starting to be called, the Roth standard was applied to Hair, and it said, well, you can't ban it just on the basis of this one out of context bit of nudity. The entirety of the work has social value, so can't ban things on the basis of an image either. So it extended uh, this ban from words uh, to images as well. Now, anatomy of a murder was the thing that really kind of undid censorship uh, in the United States. The anatomy of a murder is what created the so-called Roth standard, if you will. Uh, the New York State Censorship Board attempted to get rid of uh, the movie Anatomy of a Murder. Uh, and the reason for it was one of the characters used the word, quote, contraceptive in the movie and simply put the new york state board uh censorship board saw this as uh as a word that was uh was no good so they tried to ban the movie the producers fought back and applying the roth standard they said uh the new york board of censorship was told they could not ban this movie so censorship is basically undone in the United States. But think about how long this has taken, okay? Censorship for all practical purposes starts as it did in our very first week, our very first lecture with that so-called Comstock Act. But now in the 1960s, it's all undone. But think about how long that takes. The 1870s to the 1960s is what finally undoes all of this stuff. During this same period, uh, the Soviets were sending uh, their first satellites into space, Sputnik, uh, a basketball-shaped and sized satellite, uh, seemed to a lot of Americans like the Soviets had taken over space. So this pushed the United States uh, to engage in their own uh, move into space. In very quick response, the United States set up NASA, whose job was to get the United States into space and fast. Now, the first launches in the space program were not terribly successful, uh, but uh, ultimately, the United States pushed forward with all of this because, again, there's this fear. And again, communism is, in, is, uh, is, uh, is infused in all of this. If the Soviets beat the United States into space, then we could be in real trouble because the communists will control the next area of potential colonization. So the face, uh, the, the United States is changing. The face of the United States is changing as well. Uh, the United States city was beginning to decay. When we started this course all the way back in lecture one, cities were growing. The United States was becoming more and more urban, not less and less urban. Cities were attracting millions of immigrants. They were attracting jobs. They were attack, attracting capital. But after World War II, cities were becoming less and less essential. The big effect of the military industrial complex, complex excuse me, uh, was that the jumps in the economy meant that a huge middle class was growing in the United States. And this middle class was not content to stay in the cities. This middle class was increasingly moving out of the cities into a new invention, the suburb. The suburb was the product of government policy. Now, I'm not telling you that the government came in and said, let's create these things called suburbs and let's get everybody moving in. I'm telling you, it's the product of government policy. So it's the result of all of this stuff. The government had created the interstate highway system, for example. Uh, and as hard as it is to believe in Houston of 2022, uh, none of our highways existed, the ones that we travel uh, on and probably curse on a lot. None of those existed. Uh, in the early 1950s. When people traveled, they traveled on two and four lane roads. But President Eisenhower in the 1950s argued that the United States needed to have a system that linked the nation by this via this massive highway system for defense purposes. If we need to get people out of an area quickly, if we need to move materiel quickly, a national highway system 
will allow for all of that stuff. Uh, however, the way these highways were constructed, they wound up being created, the, the, the vision for them was more along the ideas of expressways. You don't have a bunch of exits, for example. You get in, get on in a major population center and that's it. You're not traveling locally on a highway. But the way the highway system was developed was with lots of local exits and a product of these local exits was the suburb. Now people were able to be moved out of these cities and into these su suburban areas via this highway system. Uh, also on top of that, the United States engaged in a massive loan program for home buyers. The United States government consciously uh, produced this idea that uh, we want people buying homes. We want the consumption that goes along with it. We want the economic benefits that go along with home ownerships. So the government fosters all of this stuff, not only in subsidized loans for uh, civilian purchases, but through uh, GI loans for home purchasers and all sorts of other uh, programs that foster this. So we wind up having a lot of houses being built and a lot of those houses are built in these suburban areas. The effect of this is, is that by the 1960s, 90% of all growth, industrial growth, population growth, economic growth, it's happening not in the cities, it's happening in these suburban areas. Cities are increasingly becoming the preserve of the elderly and ethnic minorities in this country. Uh, on top of this, uh, we also have the development of youth as a stage of life. Not until the 1950s and 1960s did higher education really serve an important purpose in the United States. The University of Virginia, for example, which is one of the largest colleges or universities in this country, in the 1950 or in 1950s, its enrollment was 3,000 students. Today, it's got more than 35,000 students. Similarly, the, United, the University of Houston, more locally, traces its history to 1927, but it really doesn't begin until the 1960s when they start seeing massive uh, enrollment, when it becomes a state school. These universities grew for a number of reasons. In part, it's about people in an advanced society, uh, in an industrialized society, needing to have more education. That's certainly a part of it. But as you should all be aware, there's not much of a connection uh, or not, uh, not much of a connection in every single case between the education you're getting and the job that it's preparing you for. For example, those of you who are business majors or accounting majors or nursing majors or things like that, I, I'm not egotistical enough to think that a history class is preparing you and going to make you a better nurse or a better accountant or something along those lines. There are skills you'll learn in history classes, but that will help you, but this is not going to make you a better nurse or accountant. What education does is it prepares you in other ways. People go to colleges so that they are spending money. There's a very strong economic factor within college attendance. Uh, skills like persistence and getting uh, and completion are part of what you're doing when you're in the college classroom, so to speak. So what emerges is a period of life where people are going out and doing these sorts of things. They are also, generally speaking, freed from the responsibilities of adulthood. Now at a community college, it's a little bit different, but at a four-year college where you're living in dorms and all of that sort of stuff, uh, especially which, is, which was the norm in the 1950s, and believe it or not, in the 1950s and 1960s, a lot of community colleges also had dormitories. What winds up happening is, is when you have people confined to these places where their parents don't actually live, where they're freed from those basic responsibilities of adulthood, even though they're doing all of this stuff in school, they're still freed from adulthood. This allows them to create a distinct culture with different distinct languages, with distinctive dress, with distinctive types of music that they listen to. And again, as I mentioned earlier, this is the sort of stuff that scares the daylights out of parents. We also have a fundamental change in the character of women's lives. During the 1950s, the birth rate was at its highest rate 
in the 20th century. There was the rise of the so-called traditional family. But even as the 1950s <clears throat> proceeded, uh, women were re-entering the workforce in growing numbers. There were a number of women uh, who at the start of the 1950s uh, women got married at the age of 17, would have an average of four children, and they were typically finished with that child birthing by the age of 30. So this left a lot of women in the United States with time, time to contemplate, time to think about what their lives actually meant, and a number of them actually re-entered or entered the workforce. <clears throat> as early as 1960, the pendulum had swung yet again and one third of American women were active in the American workforce. So there's a real dis uh, growing disparity here in terms of what the image of the 1950s was. And think about those images again, the you know father knows best, uh, leave it to Beaver, I love Lucy. There's that image that domesticity is the ideal, but the reality was is that women were going into the workforce. Now, the culture is clearly changing, and this stuff explodes into the 1960s. Whites were moving in huge numbers to the suburbs, as I mentioned, uh, and as I also mentioned, the cities were becoming the preserve, for the most part, of the elderly and ethnic minorities. Millions of African Americans moved into the cities to take, play, to take the place of absent populations. By, between 1945 and 1970, so many African Americans had moved out of the South's farms and into northern cities and into urban areas that the African American population just kind of flip flopped. It went from being 80% rural to 80% urban in the course of a single gen generation. That is statistically an, Im an improbable thing, and yet it's exactly what happens. Demographically, it's remarkable. Uh, but African Americans also discovered something else. Once they got to the cities, the jobs that they hoped to find were gone. By 1960s, by the 1960s, the unemployment rate of African American youths was 60 percent. During the worst part of the Great Depression, it wasn't even close to 60 percent. And the unemployment rate of African American youths was actually lower than that of Anglo youths. So. This produced something, this mass unemployment, that had never been seen in African-American populations. With a disparity in education dollars as well, increasing numbers of people out of work, out of school, and seemingly without help, by the 1960s, uh, the cities were so much on decline that the riots that happened in the mid to late 1960s were not only almost unavoidable, they were predictable. They were very clearly predictable. Now, another explosion that occurred uh, in the United States was an explosion in the nation's college campuses. Colleges were becoming more democratized, if you will. Uh, but students were, being were finding out that they weren't going to get treated like adults. Most colleges had rules that were called, uh, called parietals, meaning that there were different restrictions on women's activities than there were on men's activities. Uh, for example, women were required uh, to sign in and out of their dorms, while men uh, typically were not required to do that sort of stuff. Uh, the idea of a co-ed dormitory was out of the question in the 1950s. Uh, women were also required to obey curfews. They couldn't have men in their rooms under any circumstances. Uh, and should they be in, in a male college's, uh, college student's dorm room, uh, they were required to, they were required, uh, all parties were required to observe, quote unquote, the three foot rule, uh, which meant that there had to be three feet on the floor at all times to, you know, make sure that they weren't doing things they weren't supposed to be doing. But a bigger problem that was going on, I, I mean, and don't get me wrong, a lot of people looked at this and said, this is, this is very much a problem. A bigger problem, as college students saw it, was the lack of free speech on college campuses. Administrators restricted what could be said, what organizations could uh, be formed, what news college newspapers could say, what student newspapers could say. Uh, this led to the first large scale protests at places like the University of California, Berkeley, uh, the Students for a Democratic Society. Administrators there claimed that the Democratic Students Group 
had been organized by communists and therefore were getting rid of the uh, Democratic Students Group. The leaders denied this and began protesting against the college administration, uh, arguing things that students should not trust anybody over the age of 30, for example. These riots developed uh, and, and protests developed into something much more broad, uh, and it was sort of crisscrossing with things. The roots of this protest in things like the problems in the cities, the problems on the college campuses, are going to be nothing compared to what was coming, the civil rights movement. So when we come back for lecture 16, uh, the civil rights movement will be our topic. See you then.